Hi, friends. Uh, welcome back to Heroes You Should Know, the uh, the double nerd show where I tell you about historical figures you should definitely know about and don't, uh, and then turn them into D&D characters. Uh, as you can see this week, I have my buddy Caleb here. Hi, buddy. Hey, guys. Hey. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're back. Uh, I've realized we've done two poets. Both times you've yeah. been here, we've done poets. Yeah. Not intentional, yeah. just... I mean... You're trying to call out my my freshman year of college, basically, of me <laughs> sitting there writing really shitty slam poetry and posting it on my Tumblr for uh, attention. So, oh boy, I'm all here for it. <laughs> takes I, takes I us hope. all back to being 18. Yeah, yeah. 
Although I, I hope that these historical figures would never know that that's the caliber, a caliber of person recreating them in D and D, because God, I'm what? sorry. Like, our poetry skills might be down here. Our D and D skills are like probably above that, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> above average D and D players, which is all you can hope for in, yeah. I guess, immortal reincarnation sake. Um. Yeah. So we're here today. We're going to talk about Sarajani Naidu, who was a poet, a playwright, and an Indian independence activist um, in like the early, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, and she was called the Nightingale of India for her, for her beautiful poetry. Um, unless there's anything you want to talk about, buddy, let's let's get into it. No, I want you to hit it. Let's do this. I really let's want to talk about her. It. She's so cool. I like everyone else. She's so cool. <laughs> um, so Sarajani was born February 13th, 1879 in Hyperabad, uh, India. Um, and she was the eldest of eight siblings. Um, her father was a doctor of science and philosophy who later became the president of the Nizam College, uh, which was in the in the area. And his name was Agornath Chattopadhyaya. I'm that really sorry for my pronunciations. I'm, I looked them up. I'm working on it. Fucking uh, choice right there. It was it take was, that. It wasn't the worst. I it was worse earlier, but I'm 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 working on it. Uh and her mother was Varada Sundari Devi, and she was also a poet. And they were both Bengali Brahmin, which is like the, one of the higher castes uh in the caste system at that time. Uh as I and, said, she was her mother at the time was like regarded as one of the greatest poets that ever lived, right? Yeah, she was which like regarded is, as like an incredible poet. Right, that you can have all these people in the same family at the same time, yeah. like incredible. I cannot imagine being at home with all of these people at the same time. Yeah, like big brain family. Yeah, like in in both the intellectual sense and the creative sense, it's so it's yeah. so cool. Oh, uh, so like I said, she was the oldest of eight. Uh, her brother. Vidarendanath uh, was a revolutionary, and another one of her brothers, Harindranath, was a I poet love and an actor. You give yourself like the most generous, like full pregnant pause before you say any of them. That for a moment of like we've lost connection. No, no, no. it's just full on pre prepping the body in full effect. I just want to make sure I'm getting all of the letters in the right order and all the syllables in the right order. Cause I I've done it yeah. before where I like fuck up syllables or fuck up letter order. And I feel really bad about it. Cause I really want to make sure I say their names. Right. Um, yeah. So I have to, I have to like let my brain calm down and be like, okay, you can say these words. This is not hard. We, we should promote to like, like closed captioning graphics where it comes up in like old word art on the screen as oh, you're God. saying them. <laughs> oh man, that would be, that would be something, just like rainbow <laughs> clip art of names. Yeah, exactly. So, so we can see what it is while you're trying to say it. Oh man, that's that's an option, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so my terrible pronunciation aside, I'm very sorry. I'm working on it. Uh, the family was pretty highly regarded. Uh, in Bengal at the time. Um, both for their work at the college, but also as like famous artists in the area. Uh, and especially during like British occupation and like reign and control over India, it was pretty like risky to be an artist. And so to have a whole family who were like, yeah, we're like really highly touted for like dealing with this school and everything, but also fuck you. We're all going to be poets and actors and playwrights and do whatever we want because fuck the British essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Fuck colonialism. Fuck imperialism. We're all here to fuck get rid of that coup. shit. Yeah. I could fuck. A oh man, bringing it back, buddy. Yeah. Fuck a coup. We're here. I love. I love too that in the research I was looking at, her father desperately wanted a a another, you know, STEM person in yeah. the family, but she ended up writing a poem at thirteen, and it was like, oh fuck it, it's too good to argue. Like let another creative be a part of the family yeah yeah that's that's kind of our next point is that she was like super intelligent she knew like five languages uh english bengali urdu telugu persian uh and like you said her dad really wanted her to be like a stem person 
And then she was, I don't even, I think she was actually 12. And she wrote a poem called The Lady of the Lake that was 1,300 lines long and like gave it to him. She's like, here. And he's like, never, never mind. Go, 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 yeah. go, 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 go do this. <laughs> um, and then I think when she was 13 was when she wrote the play, Maher Man, Manur, Munri, Maher Munri, uh, which was written in Persian. Um, and so like her dad thought it was incredible. He started distributing copies to like people he knew. Um, and it turned out that the, the Nizam who was like the leader of the kingdom of Hyperabad read it. And, um, and that that's going to come back. That's going to come back in a minute. Um, yeah. But so also when she's 12, she's writing poems, she's writing this crazy play. Uh, and then she also just gets done at the university of Madras. Like, yeah. She's 12 and she's like, all right, I'm done with college and takes a four year break from her studies. And she's like, okay, when I'm 16, I'll go to college or I'll go, mm -hmm. I'll go back to college. Ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in uh, 1895, a nonprofit organization called the HEH, which is a charitable trust that grants 2000 students per year, uh, scholarships to go study, um, she she gets that and she gets that because her dad distributed the Maher Munri and the Nizam read it and he was like, All right, this one, this is one of the ones that's getting the scholarship. She's she can go. And so yeah. she goes both to the King's College in London and then later the Girton College in Cambridge. Which incredible schools. I, I mean, to yeah. be rocking all of that at this age is at absolutely 16. insane. Yeah. On on like a whim, on a tour basically of, of the world. Yeah, she's and like, oh. It's so interesting to me, so poignant that she ends up going to London being, you know, a part of the movements that she was and a part of the, the anti-imperialism that she represented to understand both their education system and her own in the same uh, lifespan and then yeah. be able to use that in a certain effect against imperialism. Like, yeah. fuck you, I will take you for what you're good for and then use it against you is... Oh, yeah. all about it. I feel like I feel like her going there was like very strategic almost in that like okay, I like you know I went to your schools, you know I'm intel I like I am intelligent as a human being, whatever yeah. your preconceived notions about people from India may be, Brits. Um uh, but I went to two of your schools when I was 16. Uh, yeah. Let's talk yeah. now. <laughs> and and it becomes like you know, some revolutionaries are firebrands and e even Gandhi has some stories about him being very in your face about the anti-imperialism or, 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 you know, aggressive in his motives. Um, I love that everything came from her from a place of passionate, empowered debate yeah. or empowered conversation where she would go on these missions out to uh, London and to uh, the Brits to talk with them directly on what they were doing to affect her home country. Yeah, like um, like this is the direct result of what you have done. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Lady Late Mike 4673 makes the point that she is uh, intelligent based on their standards, which is which has to be such like a powerful like it, it shouldn't have to be a thing. Like she shouldn't have to be intelligent on their standards. But the fact that she is and that she can be like, okay, look, if you like you can you can brush people aside all you want, but I am up to whatever bullshit your racist standards are. So now you're gonna talk to me like I'm a fucking person. Exactly. There's nothing you can do to discount what I've done thus far because I've yeah. done it by your rules and mine. Fuck yeah. you, I've done it by every rule, you know. So yeah, so she does she does this. She's just now 19 and she meets Muthiala Guvindaraj Guvindarajul Naidu, who is a physician, uh, while they're both still in school at uh, in in um, England. Uh, and after she finishes her studies, they get married. Um, so this was both an intercaste marriage, which was not allowed at the time, but both of their families approved. So they were like, "Fuck it, we're doing it." Uh, and also an interregional marriage because Sarajini was from uh, Bengal, which is in the east, while Muthiala was from uh, Adra, which is in the south. So they had like completely different cultural backgrounds, uh, and and interregional marriages were pretty rare at the time as well. But it was ostensibly a really happy marriage. They had five kids. 
Yeah. Um, and I like it's just like another like another system she's breaking through. Yeah, and like it's such a show of how progressive that family was. I know we already talked about how intimidating that household would have been, but <laughs> I was reading that and thinking about being a 19 year old studying to be a physician, studying to be all these things that's brought into the home of the legendary poet. The legendary poet that is your partner, you know, her, yeah. her father, who is a you, you know a, a man himself, basically. Um, that that whole family, the brother who is an accomplished actor, and, and trying to sit down at that table and be like, "Well, I'm going to take care of her." Yeah. Well, she's already written an epic poem at 13 that you know the president read. What the fuck do you have to offer, or whatever it might be? But it, it's really cool to see how defiant in love uh, and defiant in culture they were uh, immediately. Yeah. And I, I think about that regional thing too, because at the time India was so sparse uh, or I'm sorry, so vastly different in each region that you could go from being one dominant religion to the next, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, just by switching borderlines and, and how tough that must've been. Um, really cool love story that they, they came together like that. I loved it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so they're, they're super happy. They're in love. They, they have five children, including a, a daughter named Padmaja, who also joined an independence movement and was part of the, the quit or leave India movement, also known as the August movement, which began in 1942 as a demand for the Brits to like, get the fuck out of India, uh, which <laughs> had to be a lot on the Brits because they're still dealing with like World War II. Yeah, and I think that I, I I like that they're like no, you can deal with this too because this is yeah. you started this problem, you are the cause of this problem, you can end this problem real fucking easily. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's that's her daughter down the line kind of is a part of that as well. So they I'm sure they worked closely together during that time. Um, it, and obviously their relationship had to be pretty close since since she is the one that carried on her mother's legacy after her passing. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my favorite parts of, of the research was seeing how much she admired her mother and then carried on. I mean, she went through with producing her last book of poems and everything. Uh, I, I think yeah. it's within the the decade after her death that, mm -hmm. that she put in all that effort to make I think it, it was happen. The, I think it was like 61 that her, her daughter put the, put the poetry book out. Yeah. Yeah. So sweet. Super cool. Uh, yeah. Ladybug 4673 also points out that the Brits drafted Indians for world war two. They did in fact, and World War One, um, yeah. So, so they're like, we don't want to fight in your fucking war anymore. Leave us the fuck alone, which yeah. is so fucking valid. Um. So, 1905, her first collection of poems is published, and it's called "The Golden Threshold." Um, oh, what a name! I know. How, what like what a, a name? Cool ass name. I love all her names. I mean, I, I've been reading through her poems all this morning, mm -hmm. and every single one is just a banger in the name department <laughs> yeah oh, and the Incredible. we'll talk we'll talk about her poetry more a little bit later yeah. but the like imagery in it is so fucking good oh it's gorgeous i actually based part of her class uh, ba uh basis off of a poem directly so i'm, I'm interested oh. to see what you think oh i'm so psyched did. to see what it is yeah um yeah okay so uh golden threshold comes out it's very well received same year uh, she joins the Indian independent movement after Bengal is partitioned in 1905. Um, so this was a move by the Imperials, uh, the Imperial occupying British forces to separate the largely Muslim Eastern area from the largely Hindu Western area. Um, and so, so what, what, what kind of went on with the Indian independence movement? This is all, this is all going to be super simplified. These are basic baby principles of what happened. There are so many more in-depth dives on the actual politics and like events that occurred. I encourage you to definitely go look, the, look at those for yourselves. I just kind of wanted to touch on them. So we had a kind of background idea of what's going on right now. Um, so there are boycotts and anti-partition partition movements uh, and they're successful actually, because by 1911, the partition is revoked. So they, they, they pull them all back together. Like, okay, okay, okay. So great. Uh, and she is a, a pretty big part of that. And during that time, she's working with other like political uh, social leaders like Gopal Krishna Gokhail, um, Rabindranath Tagore and Mahatma Gandhi um, towards like freedom from colonial imperial regimes of England, as well as like social reform. 
Um, now, as we know, Gandhi wasn't a great dude. No. Um, but she she worked with him. I think she was she was part of like like I, I don't think one could have existed without the other. You know what I mean? Because she was very oh, yeah. much like a part of a part of that movement alongside him, and she had a pretty significant influence on it. Um, there was also a, a quote I saw from her in an interview where she talked about like what was it? Uh, it takes a lot of money to keep Gandhi poor. <laughs> so, so I think she was like, I don't think she was unaware, but I think she was trying to like weigh the like, okay, like, what do I like? What's, what's my priority right now? And I think the people of India were her priority over like him. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's an unfortunate truth about the situation is yeah. so many of those freedom fighters were caught in a situation where this man became the guy. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, you had to suffer the move. Uh, you had to suffer the people of the movement for the, for movement. the movement. Yeah, um, but that's why I wanted to talk about her because we hear all about Gandhi and we hear about all these other dudes and we never hear about her. Uh, and I think she is just integral to this entire process. And, and how cool that you have like Mahatma Gandhi, uh, Gandhi, one of the most notorious women haters and, and terrible misogynists that's ever existed in yeah. real history, and she was right here next to him fighting for all of the things that he hated about women uh, yeah. at, at that time, you know, fighting for women's rights, even then um, in, in the face of it, I, I think she totally needs to be heard. Yeah. I think she, it, it, from, from what the research is, it feels like she was like aware of it and she's like, okay, I'm doing work that's directly opposing this. I can, I can stomach this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Also, just the it takes a lot of money to keep Gandhi poor has a has a level of self awareness that just hits me real good. And it is such a simple fucking drag. Like yeah. it is so beautifully put that you can encapsulate that much context behind uh, a line that short. She's yeah. really quick witted. She's got. I mean, like she's got control of the words, and I think that's. I yeah. think that's one big thing for her. Well, uh, that's a poet too, right? You right. Know, a writer will tell you in a paragraph, but a poet will tell you in a word. Yeah. So again, we're just <laughs> lamenting the coolness of this person that we've only found out about recently. Yeah. W which is usually what happens to us where we'll just yeah. <laughs> ping pong back on how cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, from 1915 to 1918, Sarajani travels to different areas of India and eventually different areas of the world. Uh, including Britain and America, and I want to say South Africa as well. Um, and she lectures about social welfare, emancipation of women, um, nationalism, just kind of like putting an end to the imperial rule that British ha that Britain has there. And she's like, I th she's very much like putting it in people's faces and being like, okay, like you can you can read about this in the newspaper or hear about it on the radio, but I am coming to you directly from the area that is being affected. I am by your standards, incredibly intelligent. Here we go. Yeah. So I think that's, that's so cool. Mm. So then uh, in the middle of all that in 1917, she helps establish the uh, women's Indian association, which tries to bring suffrage and rights to hold office on the same basis as men. She's trying to like push women forward and like, just give them more power within the situation they are, uh, that they're living. Um, the same year, uh, she and Annie Besant, who was an English colleague who supported both Irish and Indian freedom, which is kind of unheard of at the time, uh, yeah. were pretty, were very loud advocates for universal suffrage in front of the joint select committee in London. So they're just like this. And this is, uh, do you remember when Britain got suffrage? I can't remember. Because this is either very soon before or very soon after Britain had women's suffrage. Uh, um, let me find out. I meant to look that up and I forgot. So uh, women gained the right to vote in 1893. Okay. So it, it hadn't oh, been... No, I'm sorry. That's not even... I was uh, like... And Mary Poppins didn't have the right to vote yet. Yeah. Which is not the touchstone I should be using for <laughs> women's <laughs> suffrage in Britain, but it is. Yeah, no kidding. Huh. 
1918 is when it was 1918 yeah uh so so yeah so this is a year before women have suffrage in india or i'm sorry not in india in britain um so like there it is it's it's mid fight for them and i remember when i was uh oh man oh and and 1928 was india thank you ladybug um so so yeah, so my I remember when I was a kid, my dad gave me this like this like four pages of stapled information. He was like, "Here, read this," and I was like, "Okay." And I was like, I don't know, eight or nine. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it was just like what women went through in the U.S. and in England for like the right to vote, and it wasn't it wasn't all like picket signs and like nice hats and you know all of that. It was yeah. like terrible treatment in prisons people on hunger strikes were force-fed food like there were like very violent invasive terrible things that happened yeah i i know just in the u.s there used to be propaganda papers you know similar to to we used to put out during world war ii or or anything like that um but it uh, it advertised domestic abuse towards any suffragette, like the the yeah. control of your spouse if the words are spoken. And, uh, you know, pamphlets would be passed out on how to control a spouse that's talking too much about the right to vote. Yeah, it's, which it's is... insane. Uh, so this is happening smack in the middle of all that. Yeah. They're working together both for the suffrage of women and like also just freedom from colonial like they're they're going against everything that men want to see in this time which yeah. is cool incredible that she she did not settle at anti-imperialism or she didn't settle at anything she was like i'm going to take every core issue i know will not be solved just with me and i'm gonna see how far i can get yeah um i mean she is totally one of those people where you start reading about her and you'll get to a fact and go, how is that not the biggest thing about you? <laughs> yeah. I, I love that. Like the, a lot of these people are just like, it's just like a, like a Rolodex of like, okay, here's this huge thing. Okay. Here's this huge thing. Okay. Here's this huge thing. And none of them are like, like none of them stand out from each other because they're all massive and important, yeah, yeah. which I, and I, I mean, they become pillars of humanity that way I, I think it's so easy to stop after one good thing and i think the reason why we end up talking about people like this is because they never stop after one good thing it's, it's yeah. one after the other it's so incredible to see and, and amazing again i know we say this every week but like how the fuck do we not know about her like i know uh, my minor in english did nothing to teach me about <laughs> indian poetry like this does nothing for me like yeah we we there's so many there's so many people that we just lose because of. All right, I'm not gonna go down that road. No, we're not gonna go down that yeah, road. because yeah. <laughs> they're not through our lens, right? And yeah. our lens is so shitty and myopic. Terrible. It's yeah. Terrible. Anyway, we'll get back on track to talk about this wonderful woman. Um, so she returns to London in 1919 as part of the All India Home Rule League to uh, continue her advocacy for the end of British occupation and the right of the people of India to govern themselves, which makes fucking sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I get imperialism pisses me off. If you hadn't noticed friends. And what kills me about imperialism is like what they teach you in school is that these were the most primitive cultures you could imagine. And imperialism brought them technology and re- reform it's and government. Bullshit. Uh, it's complete bullshit because these were fully formed societies that had been going on for so much longer than us. I mean, so much it's, longer? It's like we broke into people's homes and said, this is ours now, and then acted like we were doing them a favor by squatting in their living room. Like, it's ridiculous. Uh, I, hate it. I hate it. I hate it here. Um... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, also in 1919. The Rowlett Act is passed uh, in India, which makes sedition documents illegal. Um, which, which is essentially, which is basically to say, any documentation of like we would like to put an end to the rule of the Brits is illegal. <laughs> which is fucking bullshit. Um, yeah. Also, that sounds vaguely familiar to lots of other terrible reigns. Hmm. Like, yeah. what's 
what are those what are those dudes called from Germany in like 20 years? Hmm. Uh, hmm. Oh, like the Nazis? Uh, hmm. Hmm. Oh, Wild. right. Wild. <laughs> Uh, so that's like a whole, like sedition act is a whole thing. Um, doesn't slow them down though. Uh, literally the next year she joins the Satyagara movement, uh, which is another nonviolent civil resistance movement led by Gandhi. Um, and when he's arrested at, as like the head of it, she continues on the movement. She's like, okay, cool. You got one of them. Great. My turn now. <laughs> oh, it's so awesome. Um, so she's, she's carrying on this movement. Um, I wonder how many people took a really big, deep breath. They're like, <laughs> they, they just got Gandhi. Who's going to be next? Oh, thank God. <laughs> Sadajani, we're good. We're in good hands, guys. Um, 1925, she's elected president of the Indian National Congress Party. Um, and in 1929, she presides over the, uh, the East African and Indian Congress sessions in South Africa. So, like, people are going to a different country to try and gain control of the country that they live in. Yeah. Absolutely insane. Um, and she's, you know, she's a leader in both of those circles, which is incredible. When you think about the time that she is, again, a, a woman, and she's a woman who's getting, she's starting to get older, uh, and she still commands this incredible amount of respect and power that she that she wields for good. Yeah, yeah. And she's speaking directly to other British colonies and mm -hmm. trying to unify under the imperialism. And to be a voice like that, not only to your own country where you earned your respect, but in countries where you're coming as diplomat and, and they're unsure of what to think of you. Like the incredible confidence and the power that she wields that she was able to make all of these things happen. <sighs> Man, people are cool. Sometimes yeah. people are really cool. Really cool. A lot of the time I'm like, I hate people, but like sometimes people are cool as fuck. There are shining examples that sort of break through the crowds I could get away with losing. This one definitely, like, I, I feel like, sorry, we're going to go on a tangent. Putting this show together and like doing it every two weeks has like kind of brought a little bit of my faith in humanity back because I'm like, okay. There were people like this in the past. There are going to be people yeah. like this now. And like they're working and maybe we don't see them, but they're there and they're trying. And I want to find them so I can help them in any way that I can. I want to exactly. like, I want to like, I want to somehow be them. Um, yeah. So yeah. it's just, it, it's like, it's heartening almost. It, it helps so much on the individual level too. I found that like this show in specific is really great for, if you're unsure of what you're doing in your life or if you're unsure of where you are in this particular moment in time, it is so great knowing what people have been capable of before. Yeah. And and to be able to watch this and go and, and pinpoint where that person starts to become a hero we should know. Uh, it's so interesting because I'll watch and I'll go, shit, there's so much more I can do before I'm done. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, you know, I, I feel like I'm old, but I'm like, I'm. I'm I'm not even 30 yet. Like No, no. I mean there's so much time to do so much good. For so for like, this woman that time. To, be, to be writing epic thousand thousand page um, poems at 13, yeah. it, no one has any excuse for being too old or too young. Yeah. You know, th these are, are moments that can happen for anyone. Yeah. Just kind of keep doing good where we can. Yeah, exactly. Um Mushy sidebar over now. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's 1930, uh, and during the salt marches, uh, which are a 24-day nonviolent march to protest the taxes on salt, as well as another civil protest against the British rule. Um, An absolutely insane march, too. Right. Uh, that, that was part of what I was looking into. and The map of it is just wild. Yeah, ridiculous to look at. It's super long. They at, at one point they boiled water to produce salt, mm -hmm. uh, and that was that was one of the like tipping points for the Brits uh, because she Gandhi Jawaharlal sorry Jawaharlal uh, Nehru and Madan Mohan Malavia were all mm -hmm. arrested who were like the, yeah. the big the big leaders there. 
Um, and they were I'd they were in jail, so they missed the first round of uh, or the the first roundtable conference, which is like a discussion that was going to be held between the British and the Indian uh, officials pertaining to like constitutional reform in India. Mm, of course, they're missing from that <laughs> right. conversation. Uh, I I love that you you know like this is still one of the um, the highest arrest rates of any political march that's ever existed. I think over a hundred thousand people were arrested as a result of this march. Yeah, just like a ridiculous number. Yeah, and you can just see the blatantness of you know imperialism in retreat that they think they have to take away every major player that they can before this huge conversation. Like, yeah. how cowardly do you have to be to admit that your other side is bringing up a great point and then in the same breath to remove every great point they have before yeah. the conversation? They're like, no, it's, no, 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 no. It's comically it's evil. Over here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, you guys are in jail. We can't talk about what we're doing to you now. Ugh. Uh, but don't worry. Uh, in 1931, they did. They all did appear at the second roundtable uh, conference, which um, which they, they they covered some of the stuff that would have been covered the first time and more. Um, so over the next decade or so, uh, she's arrested multiple times for continuing her work on behalf of freeing India from Britain's rule. Uh, the longest of which was 21 months in 1942. Yeah. So she was, you know, she was, how old was she? She was like in her 50s or 60s. And she was like, fuck you, I'm going to jail, let's go. And what a year to go away. Like, yeah. what a year to lose 1942. That, yeah. oh, That's a lot. That, that yeah. is also the same year that her daughter is involved in the Quit India movement. So I feel oh. like, I feel like she was like, catch, and just like tossed it to her <laughs> daughter. And I was like, I got you, mom. How incredible that that her daughter immediately takes over for the yeah. the title, you know? That's incredible. I feel like the the British were like we we got him. We're like this is it. <laughs> and then she just rises from the deep and she's like, "Bitch, you thought." <laughs> oh god, they got another one. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> So incredible. Her daughter takes over for her. I, I, I'm assuming her daughter takes, I don't actually know. That's just the, the mean, narrative I've given it in my head. Exactly. When, if we're making the biopic, that's how we're, uh, you know, that's how we're directing this. Hucks the nuclear football over. Um, so five years after this, India finally gains independence from Britain in 1947. Finally. Uh, and Sarajani is named governor of the United Provinces, which is uh, modern day Uttar Pradesh, which is in northern India. Um, mm -hmm. And this makes her the first female governor. Uh, and she remains in office until her death. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Let's let's take a pause on that, because a lot of the first female anything in most other countries is in like. I don't know, the 70s or 60s or 80s. Yeah. 1947. That's and she's incredible. Like, Stop. <laughs> Yeah, and and that's another beautiful poet uh, made into a first female government official. Mm -hmm. it, it totally totally reminiscent of uh, of Nijuan. our first episode. Yeah. yeah. Um. So she remains in office until her death on March second of nineteen forty nine at the age of seventy nine in Lucknow. Um. And her last rites were performed at the Gomti River, which is a tributary of the Ganges. Mm -hmm. Um. So, beautiful river by the way i end up like looking into the the ceremonies that they do on that river yeah. for burial and oh my god it was gorgeous yeah they're beautiful they're I, I i'm i'm glad that she she got to have like her moment there um her last collection of poems was published after her death as we said in 1961 a feather of the dawn um so these are all poems that were written in 1927 and then posthumously edited and compiled by her daughter uh padmaja um yeah so that's we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit into poetry right now um so the golden threshold is not only na the name of the collection of poetry but also it's an off-campus annex of the university of hyperabad uh and it's the same building where her father held residence as the first principal of the hyperabad college and Incredible. is now the sarajin uh, naidu school of arts and communication yeah um, and so while her, while her family kind of had residence at that school, 
um, they were kind of a catalyst to make it this hub of reformist ideas for women in politics, education, the arts. And it was all like super progressive for the time. And like, honestly, some of it's like would be progressive now, which is really sad. <laughs> yeah. But just, I, I just I like that the whole family was like, like across the board, just like ironclad in this like movement forward. Um, in her in her life, people called her poetry uh, so beautiful it could be sung, which I which yeah. I love. Um, and she received the um, so so one 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 last a couple interesting last anecdotes. Uh, there's first off, there's uh, an asteroid named uh, after her, and an American astronomer named it after her in 1990, which I think is neat. Good job. Yeah. Um, and also in her life, she received the Kaisar Ihind e Medal from the British government, an acknowledgement for her work that she did during a plague epidemic in the late 1980s or 1890s. I'm sorry, 1890s. Um, and so, in like 1919, she returns that medal in an act of protest over the Jallianwala Bog massacre. Yeah. So so in in April of 1919, there was a big peaceful protest against uh, uh sorry, they came together in Amritsar to protest the arrest of a pro-Indian independence leader, Dr. um Saifuddin Kichlu and Satya Paul. So they were both arrested um and there were people there were there were thousands of people gathered to um to protest this and it was it was peaceful entirely peaceful um but the brits couldn't have that uh yeah. and they had brigadier general dyer uh, he had so he had all of his troops surround them uh and the area only already only had one exit um due to being surrounded by buildings on all the other sides uh and then he orders his troops to fire into the crowd even as they flee uh, mm. And so in all, 379 people were killed and more than 1,200 were injured. Um, so this happens in in a direct like response to a peaceful protest about people who want their own freedom being arrested. Uh, and she just gives the medal back. She's like, nope. Yeah. Why but, would I want this? Yeah. Like this is this means nothing to me if this is what you're doing to the people of my country. Yeah. That was one of those moments where I was like, how is this not bigger about this woman? Like, yeah. incredible that she was just casually doing plague work, like, right? like performing medicine on the side and received like a Medal of Honor for it. I had to look in a different, like I had to look in like three different places to find like the full story of that because it was just like, like brushed off the cup of like, oh yeah, plague. I was like, hold, hold, on, hold on, she did what in a plague epidemic? Yeah. Like, yeah. I found, like, the medal in one place, the plague epidemic in another, and the actual date of it in a different one. And I was like, why is this not bigger? Bigger, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's most of it. Uh, I found a really a really lovely quote that I, that I liked. Um, it's, shall hope prevail where clamorous hate is rife. Shall sweet love prosper or high dream have place amid the tumult of reverber reverberant strife. Twixt ancient creeds, twixt race and ancient race that mars the grave, glad purposes the uh, glad purposes of life, leaving no refuge save thy scouring face. Mm. I just thought that was really beautiful. Her poetry is the, the, there's like the imagery and the like. There's a lot of like natural imagery that goes into it, but also like very. How would like how would you describe it? Because I don't like I don't have the words for it. Like I feel like by tr by trying to describe it, I'm gonna make it less than what it is. She has this beautiful grasp over metaphorical speech that is both real and exists to um, to complexify her point. So you're like caught between imagining the beautiful imagery that she's putting in your head. And then identifying what each piece is actually supposed to be saying. Yeah. And so you're caught up in the beauty of the world she's creating and then the things she's trying to say with the world inside of it. It, it really is like she creates uh, a story through the poetry. It's so hard to do in the way that she does. 
because it is <laughs> line to line. You are taken to different concepts yeah. and worlds and th like, oh, it's gorgeous, gorgeous. I got caught up in her poetry yeah. this morning. Please go look it up. It's all beautiful. Uh, I think I read The Cradle... Um, cradle something. Oh man. I cradle song. Yes. Cradle song. I read cradle song this, like this morning and I read, um, ecstasy corn grinders, autumn song. They, they're just go, just go. There's a, there's a whole site that has a bunch of her poetry. Yeah. Just do yourself a favor and sit down for, I don't know, like half an hour and just read through them. It's, uh, I feel like I understand words better now <laughs> because I mm. read it. I, I have some favorites too. I, I really enjoyed uh, the poet's love song. Mm. Uh, to the God of Pain is really worth looking at. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My personal favorite was In the Forest, but yeah. there's another great one called The Palanquin Bearers. And it is so, oh, just so beautifully lyrical, just like you were talking. Like it, yeah. it was meant to be sung. Great, great stuff. <sighs> Man, super fucking cool person. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, 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 buddy. Um, what you, what you do with her? What you, what you, what you, what you, what you, what you do? I don't know why I'm okay. stuttering like this. I'm sorry. So, I mean, where do I start? <laughs> Let me start by explaining the concept. Uh, like the most important part, which is usually the classes that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Because obviously she's a variant human. Uh, all, all that doesn't really matter. But when I was trying to look at what I was going to do with her, I was thinking the same exact thing. Well, I can't just do another bard. Yeah. I, I, I can't just uh, come back and hit with the College of Eloquence, even though that fits every poem, every yeah. poet that's ever existed, right? So how can I uh, sort of contextualize this woman that was so incredibly talented both in her written word and in her her beautiful fight against imperialism. So at first, my thought was, well, she's got a little rogue in her. Um, not Ooh. not traditional. Yeah, yeah, not traditional rogue. Uh, and so that was my first instinct. And I found down the down the road, I, I was I was wrong. Like it's there, absolutely, and I'm sure that someone could do a rogue version of uh, of her, but. I don't think it was right. So what I ended up doing is I found something that felt so right for me, and that was through looking at her poems. So she is uh, six levels of bard, and we'll mm -hmm. get into that. But she's also four levels of druid. I'm so glad you did this. I almost did druid, and then I I, I, I finagled with it, and I couldn't make it fit right. So I really want to see what you did. I was really worried that you were going to do Druid too, because we always have that hive mind. So yeah. I'm glad that you at least thought about it and then fell off. And this was purely because of a poem I read from her. Uh, and I, I really want to put it out there and it's called In the Forest. So I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. But um, here, oh my heart, let us burn the dear dreams that are dead. Here in this wood, let us fashion a funeral pyre of fallen white petals and leaves that are mellow and red. Here let us burn them in noon's flaming torches of fire. We are weary, my heart, we are weary. So long we have borne the heavy loaded burden of dreams that are dead, let us rest. Let us scatter their ashes away for a while, let us mourn. We will rest, O oh my heart, till the shadows are gray in the west. But soon we must rise, O oh my heart, we must wander again into the war of the world and the strife of the throng. Let us rise, O oh my heart, let us gather the dreams that remain. We will conquer the sorrow of life with the sorrow of song. And That's it's this good one. God. Oh, it's beautiful, right? And it is so incredibly druidic in nature, but even more so, it is the nature of fire. That whole poem yes. is engaged in the nature of fire. And so what I went for uh on, on her sheet is a bard six with the college of creation um because as you and i said incredibly powerful imagery that becomes alive and then speaks her truth as it goes along um i mean it, it only made sense to me 
Yeah. Um, and then for our Druid piece, for our four levels of Druid, it only made sense after reading this poem that we go off of uh, Tasha's, we go off the new subclass. She yes. is a wildfire Druid. Um, it yeah. just made complete sense. This idea of flamed renewal, of coming back from the burning uh, and, and having to purge to become real again. And that to me is so truthful to the experience of anti-imperialism. We need to burn dead dreams and scorch earth so that someday new dreams can be born. Um, and that just spoke so much to me. It gave me chills as soon as I thought of it. Um, so you said that. And, and it's very funny because we went a very similar direction but different oh. classes, and I'm so excited. Uh, it, oh. We still have minded a little bit. We still yeah, have minded a little bit. Yeah, we uh, sun and moon. We do, it's normal. Sun and moon, buddy. Um, so, I mean, Creation Bard really hits the mark. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, even if I had gone <laughs> um, further into Creation Bard, I think it really hits her. Uh, the subclass gives you some funky stuff. Let me see if I can like. Uh, College of Creation gives you this thing called the Mode of Potential. Mm -hmm. which is this really cool way of doing bardic inspiration where instead of just passing out words and, and giving out, you know, beneficial songs, you actually create little like beings of creation, little like wisps that come oh. from your, your songs and everything. And part of the flavoring is how you create those wisps, what they look like when they come out, how you create them. And so I, I love the idea of her words becoming real and then those words drifting off and giving oh, bardic inspiration yeah. to, to the party. Um, it does some crazy stuff. It uh, allows you to uh, affect your attack rolls a certain way with them. Um, but you can basically choose, are you giving that person an ability check inspiration, an attack roll inspiration, or a saving throw inspiration? So you choose how you inspire each of them. Um, you also get the performance of creation as an action. You can create one non-magical item of your choice in an unoccupied space, creating something from nothing. And I thought that, uh, you know, added into the <laughs> idea that, that she's creating these worlds with yeah. her words. Um, she also gets counter charm, which I think comes in handy oh, yeah. when you're fighting anti-imperialism -imperial as an action you can perform until the end of your next turn. During that uh, time, you and any friendly creatures gain advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed. We will not be held back. We okay. will not be told to turn around. Um, and then, uh, you know, you get animating performance, which is pretty crazy. I mean, that was a little harder to uh, justify as a real person. But the thought of this woman making objects come to life for her, uh, I thought yeah. was interesting. Um, in the, the Druid portion, which I think maybe is the most important for, her, uh, with wildfire, the funky stuff you get is the wild companion. That's like your, your fire buddy. Basically yeah. it's a familiar that takes shape out of the fire that's in your soul, uh, as a Druid. And for that, mm. it only made sense that it be a nightingale. Uh, and yes! so she has this little nightingale made of fire that flits around her the entire time. Um, and I was even thinking of skinning, you know, the, the color of the fire in the same colors as a nightingale. Um, Ooh, that would be and, so dope. Exactly. And so she's, you know, ro rocking around with this bird that is made of pure flame. And she has this unique control over the purging and uh, creation of, uh, of new fires. Um, I, I thought that was really important to her that, that she had the ability to take action into her own hands. Uh, and it, you know, the, the idea of your wildfire shape being the uh, nightingales are not big and imposing. No. They're sort of a symbol of, uh, uh, of innocence in a way, or, or at least in beauty in small beauty. And so for that to be the source of your power, the source of your fire, I, I love it to death. Yeah, Ladybug says obsessed with this tiny ember bird image. Thank you for the like. That's exactly what I'm thinking about. Is this tiny little bird of fire, um, or like I, skimming its wings along something and just setting it alight? Exactly. Like, and that okay. So that sort of touches on 
what I gave her equipment wise. Uh, I didn't really go for anything crazy <laughs> in equipment this time, but I did uh, give her another weapon because I love, you know, skinning. Yeah. So like a Phoenix, Aaron says, yeah, definitely like a Phoenix. Yeah. Um, but for her weapon, I gave her a dagger uh, that it uh, returns to her hands when a uh, command word is spoken. Nice. Uh, and it also warns you of danger. So you have advantage in mm -hmm. initiative. Uh, it's like a dagger of alarm, uh, but it is called, let me bring it up right here. Choo, 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 choo. Uh, it, whoa. It's called the Feather of the Dawn, um, and I thought that it could be named after, you know, that, that last collection of poems, yeah. the Feather of the Dawn, um, and I imagine the hilt is being like an actual feather hilt that's you know blue and black metal that's uh, stylized in the same as the nightingale feathers um and then the actual blade would be like the tip of an ink quill uh that sort of swooped in uh daggered yeah. quality yeah. that is the vibe we like exactly yeah uh and i mean that that's the bulk of what i've done with her here I also I went it. with some some cheesy feet, so I gave her linguist and uh, and prodigy, which Ooh, linguist nice. gives you like four different languages. Prodigy gives you two skills in a language, and in addition to your stats, there. Um, I'm trying to think of any big cool else skills. Oh, skill wise, or, uh, I mean, or uh, also our spells too. Spells, uh, we can totally bring up spells. Let me bring up spells. Shoo, shoo, shoo. Uh, I mean, for cantrips, we went with uh, control flames, create bonfire, dancing lights, guidance message, press to digitation, some, some yeah. really normal ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at the first level, you've got stuff like fairy fire, uh, which I thought was very f her, and I imagine the nightingale being the one to cast that over uh, the enemy. Uh, Ooh, we yeah. also went with comprehend languages, since she was yep. such a, uh, a speaker. Protection from evil and good, mm -hmm. uh, because it's perfect for her. Cure wounds, because apparently she was a doctor. Apparently she was cured. Apparently she could do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And less uh, lesser restoration for the same reason. Nice. Uh, I went with some crazy scorching ray, yeah. flame blade, uh, because I like the imagery of that little feather catching fire. Um, I also did some protection spells, mm -hmm. things like warding wind. Ooh, uh, good one. And enthrall and earthbind so things that were of the earth and could uh protect a, a circle of area i'm you know i was trying to imagine you know if you're there to continue a march if you're there to protect a people if you're there to stop imperialism obviously the land uh is your your tantamount concern there um i also did intellect fortress which is one of my favorites it gives hey. you res Resistance to psychic damage is advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. Um, you, just the idea that she could keep every voice out of her head, um, I, I loved. And then hypnotic pattern and major image. Nice. Um, in terms of skills, I think her highest is performance, and that's just in her words alone. Yeah. Um, next up was uh, you know medicine and insight because she's obviously an insightful person. Uh, persuasion's up there. You, you know, the usual skills that would lend yourself to talking your way out of a situation, but also having a really great understanding of the person on the other side. Yeah. Oh, dude, I'm so glad you figured out how to put Druid in there, because I was, like, questioning myself over and over again. I just couldn't make it work. Um, but I did do a similar idea. Okay. Um, because I did Sorcerer 4, Wizard 6. Ah. And I did Phoenix Soul. Yep. My... Okay. <laughs> yep. I, is... I nearly did it, too. I <laughs> nearly did it. That track, that track, this all tracks for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I did Sorcerer 4 uh, with Phoenix Soul and then Wizard 6 with uh, Abjuration School. Really? That is so interesting to me because just the thought of going from being sorcerer to whiz, like yeah. the multi-class there is so interesting because you're you're changing the way your brain thinks, which yeah. is so perfect for her. 
awesome. that was definitely one of the things I was thinking about. And also like, I never, like the thing is, I never understand how people like multi-class into sorcerer. I feel like that's weird. Cause like sorcery is pretty innate. Yeah. You and know I'm what? Like, what did you, uh, what? I've always looked at it sort of like multi-classing into warlock. Like for me, the only way I see myself doing sorcerer as a multi-class is if something crazy happens. Like, right? If, if the thing that makes me a sorcerer actually happens at the table, then I'd multi-class in. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because otherwise, I'm thinking the same thing. Like, isn't that something you're born with? Like, it's maybe, it's a little tough to multi-class. Yeah, maybe it's Maybelline. Um, um, yeah. So sorcerer, she's uh. A phoenix soul sorcerer she has all the the normal sorcerer stuff uh for meta magics i gave her careful and subtle spell um perfect same reasons you it's the, the reasons you'd expect you know if you're fighting imperialism you don't want anyone to know you're casting a spell and you want and you don't want to hurt choose. your people yeah, yeah you want to pick and choose that aoe um she so so for sir feet for love so for phoenix she gets um sorry wrong tab uh, ignite at the first level, which is you gain the ability to start fires at a touch. Um, oh. Which I, which, which would, well, like, I think, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, metaphorically, I liked the idea of like setting fires in people's minds of like, okay, like, here's this, think about it. Um, but yeah. also, like, in a practical sense of like, okay, like, they need to be distracted, hear the fire. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you could take it, you know, to so many places, but fire really hit me too. Yeah. reading through all of her, not not just that poem, but all of her. And like, you could even take it to like Prometheus with the flame yeah. uh, and, and, and giving knowledge and giving understanding to these people who had lost so much and, and trying to spark understanding. Oh, yeah. I the, totally see what Fire seems to just like fit her, just like the grit of what it, it just it. It, I felt like fire just float. It, it, this is more like a vibe build than like an actual specific reason build, just because I was right. like, okay, this is, this is kind of what I feel coming from her. And I think we brought ourselves to that because the first one was so characteristic to who, uh, who, who and we Hedjuana. were. Yeah. And Hedjuana, uh, who we were building at the time. And so with this one, we got a little more conceptual. Yeah. Which I think is cool. Uh, also with Phoenix Soul, she gets Mantle of Flame, um, which is a bonus. As a bonus action, you magically wreath yourself in swirling fire uh, and your eyes glow like coals for the following minute. You gain the following or for the for one minute, you gain the following benefits. Um, you shed a bright light in a 30 foot radius and dim light for an additional 30 feet. Uh, any creature takes fire damage equal to your charisma modifier if you hit it with a melee attack or um, from within. Excuse me from within five feet of you or if it touches you. Uh, and whenever you roll fire damage on your turn, uh, the roll gains the bonus equal to your charisma modifier. So oh. just like untouchable, you can't burn me, I am, I am the flame kind of vibe. Yeah. Uh, Ladybug brings up this awesome idea of, uh, ooh, what about fire patterns on her sari? Yeah. Uh, I mean incredible incredible to think like the sort of detailing that we could do in character design for oh man for embracing those flames it would be so pretty yeah um yeah so that's basically all she gets from from sorcery um because in school of abjuration uh let me see so i i gave her abjuration just because, yeah because it's protection and it's uh oh shit gotta medicate, medicate your, cat. your cats I every every time I do this. Um, so like ab abjuration emphasizes like blocking and banishing and protecting, and that that's that's what she wants to do. She wants to like one hundred percent people and banish the British. Like that's it can't be any. Can, she can't be any other kind of wizard. I mean, can, she can I tell you this is the first time I've ever seen an abjuration wizard? Like period. Really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I've ever met a person that's played abjuration through i mean i always see it and think oh that could be fun but I, i've never touched it because it's mainly defensive but coupled yeah. with phoenix soul like yeah. that's a combo right there i feel like i'd play i haven't ever played a wizard because i'm afraid i'm not smart enough which is silly but um i've i feel like i'd play abjuration there was like another one that i was looking at that i was like oh i could play this too but like abjuration's up there 
I, I really like um first of all, you'd be plenty smart enough to do a wizard. I played a wizard, so <laughs> don't even worry about it. Uh, but there's that new one they did that's based off the elves version of uh doing magic, uh Blade Singer or whatever it is. Yeah. Blade that that one yeah. looked really interesting to me. That's one I, I looked at and um it was like lore. It wasn't lore, it was um uh, it doesn't matter. Oh. Oh, I know. I, Order of Scribes, right? Yes. The one where it's all on paper, right? Yeah, I like that one too. Um, but we're talking about Abjuration. Uh, abjuration, uh, so for that, she gets the Abjuration Savant, which means uh, time and gold to copy. Abjuration spells is halved. Uh, Arcane Ward, which um, you magically, you weave magic around yourself for protection. When you cast an Abjuration spell of first level or higher, you can simultaneously use a strand of the spell's magic to create a magical ward on yourself that lasts until you uh, finish a long rest. So the mm -hmm. ward has hit points equal to twice your wizard level plus your intelligence modifier. So for her, it would be 12, 15, like 15 hit points worth of protection around her. That's uh, pretty rocking. Yeah. And whenever you take damage, the ward takes the damage instead. And if the damage is reduced to zero, then like it carries over to you. Um, and while the ward has hit zero hit points, uh, it can't absorb damage, but the magic stays there. So whenever you cast another abjuration spell of first level or higher, it regains a number of hit points equal to twice the level of the spell. So you can just so keep it, like putting magic into it. Now, when you cast, does it add on if it still has HP? Like say you start with 15, then I cast the next turn. Does it cap over 15? Or I does don't it stay? know. I don't think it says. I Oh, okay. I think it's once once it's hit zero, then it like okay. re, re ups. Which is that's pretty crazy. If you yeah. keep casting, you're still protected. That's awesome. Yeah, I like that one. And then you, she also gets a projected ward, which is uh, when a creature that you can see within 30 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to cause your arcane ward to absorb the damage. Um, so like, and, and of course, if like it hits zero and there's still damage, the person takes the damage, but you can like send your shield essentially over to protect them, which I thought fit for her super well yeah um yeah also one of the reasons i wanted to play an abjuration wizard because i don't like that i can't protect my friends <laughs> um for spells so so she can't so she doesn't have like she doesn't know spells above a third level but she can cast up to fifth level because of weird multi-classing bullshit yeah um so i gave her a fair amount of third level spells because there are you know five empty spell slots that would benefit from having you know third level spells available uh so at third level i gave her counter spell dispel magic tongues glyph of warding remove curse protection from energy and intellect fortress oh which are all which i think you know when you're dealing with like a like an occupying force like that like a lot of those can be really as like a as a in in a fantasy world they could be very like useful remove curse uh tongues dispel magic and counter spell in particular yeah oh absolutely um and then third level or sorry second level she has knock suggestion and see invisibility um for similar reasons i think uh suggestion would be would be like interesting in the like putting like not even because suggestion's not even like you have to do it it's just putting it or i guess suggestion is technically you have to do it but like the idea of putting it in someone's mind yeah is is very interesting um knock for you know if they get arrested and need to get the fuck out of judge um and then alarm protection from good and evil sleep and shield i didn't give her a whole lot of like actual combat magic it's a lot of um it's a lot of support Mm -hmm. uh, the, I think the only real like combaty stuff I gave her was sleep and then firebolt for a cantrip, um, but everything else because because everything she was a part of was nonviolent as yeah. well. So I was I was trying to like honor that nonviolentness by I also didn't give her a weapon. Um, so I tried to like honor the nonviolent side of it while also making her like utilitarian in in mm -hmm. like, in a battle. Um. Yeah, she only has 56 hit points and she has an 11 armor class, but she's a wizard sorcerer, so we can't we can't have Yeah, all we can't complain too much, right? Yeah, I think um, we had 43 hit points on mine. 
and an AC of 14 at the highest. Which... Yeah. But she can, she can tank in wild shape, so. Yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. That's, those are our, our, our little builds there. Yeah. I, I think it was really interesting what we both came up with. Uh, yeah. It's funny. I was worried the fire thing would not be enough to, to hold up. And then both of us did the fire <laughs> thing. The fire so, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it's, it's funny. Like an old theater professor always used to say that you don't have to worry about, uh, finding the truth. The truth will find you. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny how that works of like, I, you know, was so caught up of like, I don't know if anybody's going to see that. And then we both saw it off the bat. Yeah, uh, it, It's really cool to see that this person can resonate that way in the same way for us. And, and it's a testament to who she was. Yeah. So that is Sarajani Daidu. Please go read some of her poetry. Please go educate yourself on the, the intricacies of the, of the, independence movement in india it's super interesting i just barely touched on it there's so much more information to find out please go look it up um caleb my friend thank you for for joining me this week uh is of there course. anything you want to shout out or plug or whatever uh well tomorrow on spot hidden's uh twitch <sighs> we're going to be playing another one shot just like you were a part of what was that last week it was just it last just week, last yeah. week? crazy uh, but we're going to be playing, uh, I think the scenario is called The Lightless Beacon, <coughs> which it was compared to the horror movie The Lighthouse, which terrifies me because I have to be a part of it now. <laughs> um, but I'm excited. I put together this character that is like a real piece of shit. So uh, nice. I really wanted someone that no one would mourn when he dies. Uh, well, so there so will be more left to you than just an arm. Oh, I don't think so, to be honest. With you. I was looking at my stats. <laughs> Okay, so London, when he gives us these assignments, will put out that. Did he give you the little blurb that's like, these are some skills you should look into? Yeah, I, I, I messaged him privately too. I was like, what would be useful for you as a GM to have at the table? Yes. Right. So I took one look at that list and I was like, ah, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> so I think I have, I think I have a spot hidden role, and that's about it. Um, everything else is completely useless here. No one has um, had a spot hidden. Not a single goddamn one of us. Well, there you go. So See, it's good. That's it's good the, that you did it. Yeah. That's the COC player in me. I know that it's going to come up eventually. Yeah. So I'm like, uh, I'll do whatever the fuck I want and spot hidden. So and spot hidden. It, it, it'll be funny. I'm playing basically a full charisma character in a place where there's no charisma. That's my boy. Yeah. I thought I might as well pull my brand here but if you guys want to <laughs> check that out uh we're going to be playing that on spot hidden's channel tomorrow at i believe it's 6 seven PM. 6 oh, p.m 6 p.m there you go yeah 6 PM. um but yeah stop them by that's what we're doing uh and then just keep your eye out because ahsoka i, I mean are we are we how end close are we week. to the end here end of this, this week, week it is it is all coming to a close yeah uh at the end of this week please keep an eye out for ashoka precious cargo episode 12 yeah our finale uh it took us two sessions to play who knows how long the audio is going to be um, oh my god i definitely cried more than once so look yeah. forward to hearing me cry in your ears yeah this um, this Friday, if you would like to send me messages on Twitter that are, are nothing more than a hug, that would be appreciated because Friday is a doozy, doozy for me. Just weeping. Um, yeah. That. Oh God, but, I just remember. Oh, I just remember that part too. Yeah. Oh my boy. Yeah. Uh, a lot. A lot goes down. It's Eli. Eli runs. Eli always runs a stellar game, but just fucking next level. Yeah. Kills it. Sergio says uh, so much, but the elves <laughs> and uh, what he's referring to is that there's a good like 15 minutes where we just talk about how hot elves are. <laughs> it's a riff. And I think it's just you two as well. It is. It's <laughs> I, I love me some elves, man. Uh, That's why we put elves, elves in space for you, Bubba. Oh, you did? They're in? Okay, thank God. A little bit. Oh, perfect. Um, 
Yeah, so keep an eye out for those two. Uh, as always, our, our regular programming, Mondays, Aaron is on the Sheep Farm. Uh, he's been playing through Hit Farm. It's been, or not Hit Farm, Jesus. Hit Farm. <laughs> Hit Man. Um, and it's been horrifying and hilarious. Um, so check that out. Uh, Tuesday, we're back uh, doing Starforged, and you will see yours truly there uh, this week. Um which is sure to be horrifying and sad. Um, I'm so nervous about it. Um, yeah, and keep an eye out as well for our uh, our 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 betweeny times content. Uh, yeah. We're we're in the middle of recording Doom to Repeat Arc Two, which is oh my so god, stressful. yeah. It, uh, if you listen to Friday and you're stressed, just wait because. We're so not even was, like so halfway through the up. damn thing. Yeah. We're we're technically halfway through, I think. Are we? I think so. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it. Sergio, Sergio's bringing fire to destroy all of our souls. Yeah. We're we're like stressed about it because we have to play it, but hearing it, I think is going to be dope as hell. Uh, he had some he had some help from from a fellow from a fellow DG podcast Vince from over on Black Project Gaming. Uh, gave him a little bit of a hand. If you are a fan of that, you will, you will, you'll see Vince's influence. Yeah, in the yeah, way you'll it definitely see both it. Of us. Oh um, man, yeah. There's so much that we go through. Anyway, also, I just found out from Ladybug in the chat here that apparently Anchor and Rad are a ship. And oh yeah, uh, man, Lex, that's incredible. Lex on on Twitter asked what the uh, what the ship name for Anchor and Rad was. And I, I decided it was co-captains, so. Co-captains is great. Yep. Oh, uh, my God. How did I miss this on Twitter? Lex also said Ranker was a good one for Anchor and Rat. Ranker which I like. is incredible. Um, but I'm I'm a fan of co-captains. Um, so, yeah, if you want to hear, hear more about this ship that Caleb and I have come up with our own names for other ones. But uh, if you want to yeah. hear more about An Ranker or co-captains, uh, tune in Tune in the end of this week and you'll hear some yep. more. I mean, maybe you'll hear I will. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> thank you guys for joining us. We'll, uh, we'll sign off this rambling and um, take care of yourselves. Be safe. You know, all that good stuff. Um, and have a good night. Bye, friends. Yeah. Bye, guys.